Well, here we are today on the campus of Moorhead State University, and we're happy to have along with us Jeffrey Hill, who is professor of media productions, and Michael Jones, one of the students here. And first of all, Professor, or may I just call you Jeffrey? Jeffrey, sorry. All right. Uh, this is really great. We've had at KET a great relationship with Moorhead State University. Tell us a little bit about exactly what you do here at the school. Yeah, I've been here since 2002 and I'm a professor of media production and uh, the really nice thing about our program is that students, their first semester here, they're doing the deal. They're doing the production work so that by the time they get to their third or fourth year they're doing projects that are getting picked up by film festivals, they're doing documentary projects that are being picked up by KET. So it's a really great opportunity for the students. Wow, so you'll have uh, how many in your class now that are all taking part in these productions? Uh, we have about 18 students will be yeah. in a class and they work in smaller groups. So they'll work in groups of four to six. And you were telling me earlier that they start as freshmen, so they really get a chance to work themselves all the way up. Yeah, I mean they could very easily be involved in 80 half hour television shows and 40 different website uh, scenarios that they create. There's a lot of opportunities for them. Wow, and Michael, you certainly have uh, done your own film, is that correct? Yes, sir. Tell us a little bit about the, the film that you did. Well, the film that we did was um, working with um, local high school radio mm -hmm. and uh, high school sport radio and how it has an impact on the region. Um, we interviewed our, uh, our NPR uh, game play-by-play uh, -play analyst for Moorhead State football and basketball, uh, Chuck, and uh, he, um, he did a great job. Um, we set up a few interviews with uh, a, a man from Winchester and we also did a uh, interview with a, another local man that did uh, also his own talk show radio, his own broadcast radio. Well, I, this is great. So you have students like this that are uh, performing all these great things. Uh, uh, now, since you have done this, will you try to do another one before school's out, or is this pretty much it for you for, throughout the, the rest of your school year? I have one more semester, mm -hmm. um, if it pertains to it. I have an internship with the football team right now, and I'm helping with productions that they do. I'm doing special projects for the coaches. Um, I'm filming the games and practices. Um, another opportunity given to me by uh, just networking within the major, talking with the professors and I absolutely love it. I love interacting with the players more than anything else. The coaches are great and I show up about every other day for practice around four to six and I'm there and I'm doing my job and I'm learning. It's on hands work. Um, I think that this major is probably the most on hands that you can get for the career that you want to take. Now, this is not what you really want to do. You really want to take my job playing ball with the Cincinnati Reds. Yes. <laughs> yes. Whenever uh, I walked in and saw that you were interviewing us, my eyes got real big. I saw you when I was a kid, me and my, me and my dad, we were, um, we were big fans. We were big fans. All right. I'm excited to see your film. We're going to take a look at that right now. A couple of things I think is really special. Uh, a really good play-by-play -play man can just—he paints a picture of your of the game in your mind, and you, it's just like you're almost there. And uh, at times I've been just excited listening on radio, maybe more so than actually being at the game or, or watching it on TV. When you talk about high school sports, for many communities, especially in very rural areas, those are their points of pride. They look at their high school football, basketball, baseball teams, soccer teams, what have you. And, and for them, that's a point of pride that they can boast about, especially if their teams are really good. And a lot of people seem to always be interested, even if they're not at the games, in what those teams are doing. They want to talk about it. They want to find out if they're good. They root for them. I think it's important for these cities, uh, especially smaller communities in rural areas, they become places where they rally people and, and people find that as a gathering place and it's something like a unifying point for them in a sense that it brings people together that may be not always together. Well, I think radio's brought an awesome value to sports. Uh, you know, with me, in, like in the 60s, when I was listening to them on this little radio, um, they weren't on TV that much. So you had access to all the games right here on the radio. 
and I think it's neat that even today, like if like with your iPhone and if you got the the uh, the app for the radio, uh, you can still pick the games up there. Like when you're out, like when I'm at work and I'm, or I'm running around doing stuff here at the house, and I don't have time to sit down and watch. I can still keep up with what's going on with the game. And uh, if you're a uh, you know a big, a big sports fans like like I am, you don't there's you don't want to miss games, but it gives you. Uh, an opportunity to keep up what's going on. Local high schools and the broadcast they do of their games provide a lot of those radio stations with a pretty good chunk of their income on an annual basis and without those sports broadcasts many of those stations might not be able to make it. You know I worked at a station, a small station, where I think about one-fifth of our total income, sometimes up to a quarter of our income on a yearly basis, came from doing sports broadcasts of high school football and we did a couple of schools for basketball. So it's an important economic driver in these communities too as well. Uh, you know these local radio stations again may not be viable without those sports programs. And the one thing that I found that local radio stations provide as opposed to say satellite radio now that's become in vogue and maybe some of these national services that are out there is they provide a voice for a community. Uh, they provide local information that people can't find anywhere else. And when you talk about high school sports, I mean obviously if you're talking about your local high school, it's not going to be on any other station anywhere else. So what I've always believed with small town radio in general, small market radio in general, the more local you can be with all of your programming, the better off you will be because you're speaking to your community and you're relating to your community and it can thus relate back to you and it's going to be an investment in their time and you're going to make money from that because you know people like to listen to it, that means advertisers want to be on there. So I think it's, it's an important part of every small town. These radio stations, whether it's sports or whatever they do that's local, it, it really, it, it's a big thing for these towns. Of course, the Kentucky basketball, Kentucky football, and then the Cincinnati Reds. Um, the announcers uh, of Kentucky, uh, Kaywood Letford, you know, he's a legend. His uh, banner is hanging in Rupp Arena. Um, I grew up listening to Kaywood on this little transistor radio, <laughs> AM, we lived close to Louisville so I could uh, pick the games up at that time, WHAS out of Louisville carried off Kentucky's games. And of course back then they weren't on TV like they are now, so uh, a lot of the games you had to listen to on radio. Uh, but uh, I remember as the first season I can remember was probably 1966, I was been nine years old in uh, sort of rupturants and I remember going to bed at night and, and having this radio with me and listening to games. Uh, Kaywood would always, uh, if Kentucky wasn't playing well, he would just, you could tell it in his voice, and he just, he, his phrase was, well, their, their performance leaves something to be desired, you know. <laughs> but, but those things like that, you uh, kind of stick with you, you know. Um, I never did forget uh, some of those things, but. People like to listen. People like to hear about things they know about, places they've been, people they know. And that's why, with what we do in local news, for instance, we talk about our region, we talk about our city, we talk about our county, because people want to know what's going on around them. They want to know whether or not their local high school basketball team or football team is any good. Even if they don't, they may know kids on the team or the parents, or they're related to some of these people in some way, and they want to see them succeed, so they have a vested interest in what's going on. So I think that that's always going to be there, and I think that's, that's kind of the cool thing because I can remember when I first came to Moorhead 30 years ago and was listening to a Round County, Bath County football game. Some of the names that I heard during that broadcast, some of those last names you'll still hear in a Round County, Bath County football game today because they're related to those people. It might be the sons of the people that played back then. They may have uncles or whatever. Uh, this may be cousins, but it, it's kind of neat. It kind of passes through generations. So that interest level is always going to be there and you're always going to be rooting for your local high school team to succeed. So it means a great deal to them. And I know, for instance, from the standpoint of Moorhead State University, I mean, here we are, a university in a town that's about 6,000 in the county of about 22 two, twenty, three thousand people, and people take pride in that. It's kind of that uh, David and Goliath thing. We're sort of like David, and we go up and play bigger schools, and that's the Goliath factor. And I mean, they take that pride that we're the underdog, and they want to see us go out and be successful. So we're a point of pride for this community to say, hey, we have a university with Division One athletic teams. 
Jeffrey, you mentioned earlier talking about the film festival. Did you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. We started that about 12 years ago, and uh, it's based on the 48-hour film project. And what happens basically in the spring, on a Friday evening at about 4 o'clock, groups of students will come together, and I'll give them an envelope. It'll have a character's name, a prop, a genre, and a line of dialogue. And they've got till Monday morning to make a movie. <laughs> and then that night, we do a world premiere at the local movie theater here in town, and we'll have anywhere from 150 to 350 people come out to screen it. We give them prizes. We do a red carpet. It's, it's a lot of fun. So that was your baby? You started that? I did. Yes, I did, about 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it sounds like it's been highly successful. It has. And, and the students have had a really great opportunity to, again, do production work. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Well, we have a guest. This is not Michael Jones. This is Ricky Nelson. Yep. Hi. Now, do you get a lot of teasing about your name, about the singer Ricky Nelson? Yes, yes. Every every adult that I talk to, they're like, Ricky Nelson, is that your real name? And I'm like, yes, yes, that is my real name. You know he's a singer? Yes, yes. I, ha I have a couple of his 45s. No, you actually. don't. Actually, yeah, yeah. That is good to hear. Mm -hmm. That's good to hear. Well, tell us a little bit about your film uh, that you did from your hometown back in Ashland, Kentucky. Ah, my film. Um, I have been working at the Garden Roller Rink for seven and a half years since my uh, senior year of high school. And they're open every Friday and Saturday evening from 7 to 10.30, but we also do birthday parties all day on Saturdays. And it, I've been there so long because I, my bosses, they're, the, they're family now, and I love roller skating, and I love uh, just getting to interact with the kids and knowing that the kids have a good place to go and enjoy themselves and hang out so I thought it would and it's been up and running for a total of 40 years Wow! and I just thought it was really great that after all this time roller skating is still something that children want to do and you know they get exercise they get to socialize they get to you know learn how to talk to each other and they also get to have fun somewhere safe where their parents can know you know hey I don't have to worry about what they're doing yeah. so this uh, roller rink was, did you have any other choices or was this is just what you wanted to do right from the very beginning? Uh, the roller rink was, it's always something I've wanted to do. I knew I wanted to make a documentary about it, and I was hoping I would get the chance to whenever I took the documentary class. Bill deserves it. He, you know, he deserves credit for running this skating rink for 30 years, and I just wanted to do it for him and to have this opportunity. Pretty cool. Yeah. Let's take a look right now. I got the skating rink. Um, I was laid off from another job, and this had belonged to my dad. And the lease ran out from the other people that had it. It was called Perry's Roller Rink. And uh, he asked me, do you think you could run it? I said, sure. And that was 30 years ago. Skating has kind of dropped down in popularity. Well, that's the one thing that hasn't changed. In, in this era, is, is skating is still basically the same. Um, you put skates on, you go around on the floor, but it's a place where it becomes to socialize. My parents met at a roller rink, and that's why the, this roller rink is here. Uh, they enjoyed it so much, Ashland didn't have a roller rink. Uh, Black's roller rink had burnt down, and he actually started building it before he had anybody to run it. He wasn't going to run it, that was not that's something he liked to do. First of all, you have to clean it, and you have to repair everything that's broke, skates, chair seats. Kids can be, not intentionally, but they can be hard on, on stuff. So you have to go through and make sure everything is safe, everything is clean. Snack bar, you're inspected by the health department, and uh, we make sure it's clean and ready to go. But it takes, it takes a little time to do it. And it's a big building. It's, uh, actually, uh, Linda worked for me. Uh, she's my wife now, but she worked for me, and um, we used to stay after we closed and skate. And that's how we got together. She yeah. knows the kids, she knows their behavior, and she's a very big help to me. Uh, it'd be hard to run without her. You, know, you need younger kids here to work for you because they do relate to the kids that come in here. Um, and usually this rink is their first job for just about all of them. And this is where they get to start. So I, I have to not only watch the, the children, but the employees, because they're just learning. And, uh, but, I've had, but I've had a lot of great employees over the years, a lot of them. 
the best part about running this roller rink is providing these kids with a safe place to come and socialize. Uh, a lot of small towns don't have that. Uh, we're lucky we have one here. Uh, the, this rink's been here for 40 years now, and there's been thousands upon thousands of the kids come through here, and a lot of them learn to socialize with each other, and we keep them safe, and they have a lot of fun. Yeah, I made a lot of friends, actually. I made about 10. Yeah, I like that my mom brings me here. I like skating. Is not, it, the, the part about the appeals is, is part of it is the socialization that they have being here. But it's also a physical activity that they get in the music. You got to have good music that they like to listen to. You can't go back to the old style of organ music or you'd have nobody here. So you have to play current music, but they can come in here and socialize with their friends and listen to music, and they, all of them have fun. Yeah, uh, yeah that's why I'm open. Uh, I, I do have cameras in my office. I can sit there in my office and watch what everybody's doing, but I prefer to be out among them, and that way parents are assured that their, their child's being watched, the place is being watched, and the, the kids know that they're being watched. So they behave. You have to have adult supervision with children, and you have to be seen. And but uh, I enjoy being with the children. I enjoy sitting down and talking to the adults. Uh, sometimes that's the only chance I get to talk to an adult is during a public skating. But we have a lot of parents that come sit with their children, and a lot of them have a good time with their child being in here. My name is Mary Ann Boggs. I have been coming here um, I've lived in this area now for about, oh, no, probably about 13 years, so I started to come in um, when I moved here, so about 13 years now. It's appealing to come to this skating rink because it's close to us, the people are super friendly, uh, Bill's always very accommodating to the children. Um, it's just really a nice environment for me to bring my kids to. I bring my children here for the same reason that I did it as a child. Um, keep them out of trouble, it, it's exercise, it's good for them, and it is something that I did as a child, so it's important for me to kind of keep the, the tradition alive. Um, yeah, I used to have, my brother used to be in partnership with me, and he died about five years ago. And we used to split up the hours, especially on the weekends. Uh, since he has passed, it's, uh, I have to take his hours. And that makes working out here seven days a week. And that's some long hours. Uh, it's hard, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I, 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 you know, I, it's for the kids and for this community. So I do it. <laughs>